So welcome everyone, week four. Assignments, at least first assignment done. Everyone can breathe a sigh of relief. Um, this week is a bit of a lighter week in lieu of that. So it's just looking at some of the things we've already talked about in terms of assets and then taking them a little bit of a step further. Topic overview, we'll look at the framework definition of assets, um, which again is similar to what we did last week. But I do want to talk about it um, this week because we're looking at a different type of asset and it's important to link up what we know about assets and what you guys already had looked at and look at it in a slightly different context. Um, what information content those assets include, it's particularly from an intangible point of view, and this is quite relevant and even from a valuation perspective because what we're starting to see is, and, and really today um, sort of hits that on the head, is that there are things which are definitely valuable to businesses. They're definitely valuable to companies, but you will not see them being recognized in the statements. Or if they do happen to be recognized, they're not necessarily the values that people consider there to be worth. So we're gonna look at why that's the case. So knowledge of the rules and knowledge of what gets included in the accounting numbers is quite important. Um, are there incentives to adjust? Role of regulation, and we're gonna look primarily, well, we're gonna look at intangible assets with some deviations into impairments and some deviations from that into fair value. So SSSB 13 in a little bit more detail than what we have done previously. So that's where we're going. Okay, so the balance sheet, we looked at this last week. This is Qantas's balance sheet. The thing that we're looking at this week is this particular line down here, which is $741 million. Now the thing to recognize with that is that $741 million is the recognized intangibles. There's a whole bunch of stuff which is valuable, which are intangible assets, which people would consider to be useful for businesses, but they're not on there. They don't exist from an accounting perspective. So what we're exploring today is what things do exist, what things don't exist, and why they do or don't exist there. Um, so the framework definition of assets, uh, we've come across this before. An asset is a resource controlled by the entity as a result of past events and from which future economic benefits are expected to flow to the entity. Control is important. <coughs> past events are important and future economic benefits are important. But intangible assets don't necessarily hit all of those things. And so this isn't the rules and regulations at this point. This is just the framework and where we're going with it. But we're already starting to see some of the things which are potentially problematic to bring these intangible type assets on the books. I think for a large part, control is not necessarily an issue for a lot of them. You know, I'm not, that wouldn't be for every single one, but control would generally be speaking be okay. A past event, by and large, would generally be okay. Things have been developed within the companies, that's happened over time. On the definition side of things, what we're starting to get to is, future economic benefits is where we start to hit some problems because that, that potential to contribute to the, cash flow, to the flow of the cash to the entity, a lot of things may well have the potential to, but the recognition is what's important. Does it meet that criteria for recognition? Um, and we'll get to that. Lots of things have physical form. The building that we're in has a physical form as an asset. The furniture, the chairs, these little USB pointers, phones, all have physical form. But that doesn't necessarily mean there are things which don't have physical forms, which are, not, which are also assets to the business, because they certainly are. If I plugged it in, it would work. Okay, what I want to show you first, because I want to talk a little bit about this, because it's actually quite a good example of some of the issues around um, intangible assets. A lot of people would argue that things like advertising and branding and marketing and the money that you spend on these things is valuable. I mean, and on many cases they are correct because it does give rise in many cases to people buying stuff. If they don't know your products out there, it's hard for them to go off and buy it. But what I want to show you quickly is an advertising campaign that ran a few years back, not really in Australia. Um, And I just want to talk about it a little bit because it gets at some of the issues around the recognition of these as assets. That looks a bit funny. What the? 
Oh, it's a day for technical awesomeness. Um, give me a second, I'll flip back. All right, there we go. We poured you a beer. And we've had the camel shampooed. And Bill's on his way down to open the front gate. And we've turned on the lights. And we've been rehearsing for over 40,000 years. So where the bloody hell are you? I don't like how it automatically rolls into other things. Anyway, that question at the end is actually a fairly good one because $180 million was spent on that campaign. And the whole point of a tourism campaign is to try to bring people from somewhere else to where you are. The whole point of tourism, I suppose. Now, they spent $180 million on it and there are three primary markets in which that was actually aired. Get rid of it. Um, Japan, Germany and the UK. Now, if you think an advertising campaign should work and your tourism campaign should work, you'd expect to see more people show up from those places once you've aired it. What actually happened was fewer people turned up from those markets where they aired it. From other markets like China where it didn't show, more people started showing up. Now, it's maybe a bit of a stretch to say this campaign stopped people coming to Australia, but it certainly didn't seem to have this overall benefit which they expected it to have. So there is a danger with some of these things to capitalise them because this idea of you spend money on advertising, it will give you a benefit, doesn't necessarily always hold. We talked about Gareth last week. A lot of money was spent by Real getting him over there on top of then is just weekly wages. Now, what we're thinking about is from, a, from a, an accounting point of view, do they control this spend? Do they control that player? Do they have, does he drive future economic benefits for the business? If so, start thinking about the mechanisms that could be from. Um, is this a past event? Coca-Cola. Um, now, brand names are really important. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about brand names in a second. Yes, they can, you know, brand names are controlled by the business. They come from past events. They give them future economic benefits. But there are other aspects to consider with it, and we'll get to those. Customer satisfaction. Those are pretty important things. If your, if your customers are not satisfied, if, they, if your customer service is terrible, people aren't going to come back, you're going to start losing money. Should that somehow be captured as an asset or potentially as a liability on the books? I don't know. Start thinking about it from a framework perspective. What do you think should happen with that stuff? Could it happen? So in terms of recognition, an asset is recognised when it is probable that you're going to get that benefit. So we're starting to think about that advertising campaign. And the cost or value can be reliably measured. And we're starting to think about brand names there. Now, do these assets tell us something? Now, what we've got here is just a random list of five companies, five big Australian companies, from a mine or a bank, <coughs> groceries, media, and an airline. I've got the market value of equity, which is just their market capitalization. So if someone, not assuming sort of premiums for takeovers and whatnot, if someone was to buy all the equity, it's currently valued, say, for BHP at $105 billion. But if you look on the accounting financial statements, if you look on the balance sheet, the net assets of that business are not 105, they're 86 billion. There's a difference there. And I've done that with each one of them. And what's the trend that you see when you compare those five companies? They are more than the book value of equity. Yeah, the market value is greater than the book value of every in every single one of those cases. Now, it's not always going to be the case. There are going to be times when it's a reverse. But what this is picking up is, let's say for Woolworths, it's only worth net assets are only worth 11 billion, but its market value is about 38. So it's quite substantially higher. So there are things which are either not recognised or there are assets which are recognised but their cost on the books is less than what their market value is. And that's affecting that. And some of that is going to be intangible assets because as we're going to see, quite a number of intangibles don't get included on the balance sheet. And we're going to look at why that is. 
But even for things which are included, and cast your mind back to last week, property, plant, and equipment. What are the two, especially for the guys that have come from the tutorial, this should be top of mind. What are the two different ways in which property, plant, and equipment get accounted for subsequently? The two different models. Cost model and revaluation. What is the starting point for the cost model? Cost. That means that's as high as it can go under that model. If it's valued more than that, that doesn't get picked up in terms of the amounts that you see there. So just by choosing the cost model for property, plant, and equipment is going to keep, is in part going to explain some of that difference. Now that's not to say there are other things included, whether it be growth options or things out there which are important to those valuations. But the important thing is the accounting numbers are driven by rules about certain things. What you see as market valuation is what the market perceives the value of those assets to be, and those aren't necessarily the same thing. So keep that in mind. Um, so there are incentives to adjust assets. Um, there are a variety of incentives for management to do these sort of things, whether it be closest to debt covenants, management compensation contracts, impacts on profitability. Now this is over halfway through the topics to the mid-semester exam. At this point, this is the same slide from last week. I was being efficient when I was putting this stuff together. Either that or being lazy, one of the two, you choose. Now, but what you should be doing with this is not limi limiting yourself to these sort of things. You should be thinking about each of the elements. You should be thinking about assets. You should be thinking about liabilities when we get to week six, about profit. What reasons are there to, to move these things, even if subtly, to move these things up or down? And link that, and you've got to start being explicit with it, link that to decision-making uses, link that to contractual uses, because those sort of things are the types of questions you'll get in relation to the week one material um, around incentives around what management may do. And you'll see examples of that in past mid-semesters. So the role of regulation is either efficient reporting or opportunistic reporting. So again, I would say majority, vast majority of companies do it the right way. Now I will make a comment here that doing it the right way and being absolutely correct are two different things. Because as we, start, as we have started to see, and we will start to see more and more, there are a lot of forward-looking estimates within the accounting numbers. It's not just, I paid X for this and that's, I know this with, certain, with certainty. It's, I paid X for this, I'm depreciated over 10 years with a certain residual. I could not be trying to be tricky about this and still get that residual estimate wrong. It's not because I was trying to pull one over on anyone, I just got it wrong. So, and you, that does happen and there's not a problem with that. Where opportunistic reporting comes in is where they're biasing the numbers to make a particular sort of outcome happen. The idea of regulation is to limit some of their choices and the purpose of accounting regulation is to limit accounting policy choice. So moving into intangible assets. So SSB 138. Now for those, for those that had a look at 116, and I really hope all of you did, um, you are probably about five steps ahead of me when we come through this because 138 is very similar to 116. There's a huge amount of similarities here. We'll pick up on the differences and focus on them, um, but there's a lot of similarities there. The primary issue is actually really similar, basically with this slide, change in tangible assets from property, plant, and equipment and throw in a Coke brand sign here. But the big issue that we're really looking at is around recognition. It's, that is the key thing, because what intangible assets can be recognized and what can't, and also importantly, why? Everything gets covered, all intangible assets get covered except financial assets, which we'll look at in financial instruments. Exploration and evaluation assets, which we'll look at next week. And development assets for natural resources, which we will also look at next week. Okay. So what an intangible asset is, is an identifiable non-monetary asset without physical substance. Identifiability really comes at this idea of separability. And it's almost like, can you pick it up? I mean, it, there's other elements to it. But could you on-sell this if you had to? And so when you think about Coca-Cola and its brand name, 
could Coke sell its brand name, just the brand name, nothing else, not manufacturing equipment, not business units, just the brand name and still be the business? I don't know if even that would, I don't know if that, even know if that would be possible. May well be, but I think it would hard to exist. So that's very much wedded to that business. And so separability is an important aspect to it. It's non-monetary because when you consider what a lot of money is nowadays, we don't withdraw a lot anymore. It's tap and go. It's all in our accounts. It's all just digital. Um, and it doesn't have physical substance, which is what an intangible asset is. An intangible asset shall only be recognized if and only if it is probable that the expected future economic benefits that are attributable to the asset will flow to the entity and the cost of the item can be measured reliably. And that cost is an important aspect to it. Because when you start talking about cost, that generally means that you've purchased something. And if you purchase something, it generally means it's come from outside. Whereas if it's been internally developed, you haven't necessarily paid for something. You may be worth more, the company made that brand name or whatever it happens to be may definitely be worth something. But generally speaking, there's hard to put a reliable cost to it. And so that becomes a bit of an issue. And you measure it at cost. Okay, so we split these assets up into separately acquired and internally generated. And as you can probably already guess, most of these get recorded as assets and most of those don't. So that's just the kind of high level overview. Um, so separately acquired, we discuss how to deal with buying an intangible asset. So it goes through a number of paragraphs there, worth having a look at. There are a whole bunch of things you can buy which are intangible assets. Now I've got taxi, license up, taxi licenses up there and I will talk more about taxi licenses later on. But you can go off and buy taxi licenses. Now, the cost of a taxi license in New South Wales is about $375,000. We're not talking about the car, just the plates to be able to, and the license to be able to run a taxi. And that's quite expensive. You can buy a poker, and again, poker machine licenses are an intangible asset. It's not the poker machine. Last I saw, and this is going back a couple of years, poker machines are about, poker, poker machine licenses are about $40,000. So again, that's not the actual physical machine, that is just the entitlement to be able to run a machine in your pub or your club. Patents, you may get to take out a patent on something, it costs a little bit to do. You may buy a customer list, customer information from somewhere else. We'll talk more about that later on. Um, key thing, you've got to be buying this stuff. And if you're buying this stuff, it means you've got a cost because you paid someone for it. And really similar to my shoes from the UK. Purchase price, everything ready to get that asset, everything you need to get that asset ready for use. Really similar to inventory, really similar to property, plant, and equipment. So it's the same idea when you have intangible assets. Okay, quick show of hands. How many of you guys are doing ABC this semester? All right, so a reasonable number of you. So purchase goodwill. This is, the, this is pretty much the sum total of what we'll do with goodwill. You guys are doing it a fair bit, or if you have done ABC, you'll have seen it. Facebook in 2012 paid a billion dollars for Instagram. That's not a billion, that's not a billion with an M. It's a billion with a B. They paid a billion dollars for it. Now I'm pretty sure I haven't looked at their accounts, but I'm pretty sure that Instagram's net assets were not a billion dollars. They paid 19 billion for WhatsApp. 19 billion. That's ridiculous. I don't even know what WhatsApp is, let alone why you pay 19 billion for it. But maybe I'm just getting old. I don't know. Um, but if you pay more than what basically the net assets of that business, that business is, you've got goodwill. And goodwill is basically a balancing item. If you happen to pay less than the net assets of the business, you have a bargain purchase. And the standard actually tells you to do this. They go, well, that just seems really weird. On a commercial basis, how did you end up managing to pay less than what this thing is worth? So the first thing they tell you to do is actually double check it. Double check it. If the numbers still stack up, then you record that as a gain straight up. And that's pretty much goodwill and bargain purchase. 
Important with this, this is purchase goodwill. This is stuff where we purchase another business. This isn't about internally generated goodwill. Internally generated stuff, getting to. Now, internally generated goodwill shall not be recognized as an asset. Almost oh, sounds Lords of the Ringish. You shall not pass. Anyway, paragraph 48, you shall not recognize it as an asset. Can't put it on that. And the idea behind that is it's not separable because it's you developing your business. You've set up something, it's gone really well. You can't take that and sell it off to someone else. So, so it's not separable. I don't know if I tend to, agree. I don't know if I tend to agree with the second one, this idea that it's not controlled, but you know, that's what they say. Not reliably measured, I'd absolutely agree with. There is a reliability issue with the measurement with a lot of intangible assets, which are internally generated because you're getting estimates on these things and estimates aren't always that reliable. Now before, let's probably jump the gun a little bit there. The reason I show this is because we're about to go into research and development and I just thought, this is spruiking UTS. Um, has anyone heard of, heard of this and, and this particular guy? No? Okay, because I know they talk a little bit about it um, when I've come to those welcome, welcome sessions and they talk about, staff and, and graduates who are doing good things. So Jordan Ewan, 27 years old, although probably a couple of years older now, he works in engineering here at UTS and his father is, is, I don't think he's a professor yet, but his father is also a professor here. And they've actually come up with a thought powered wheelchair. So you can have someone sitting there and actually take it around where you need to go completely driven by thoughts. That's pretty cool. Um, and for some, you know, I've had, a couple of friends who would probably benefit from this sort of thing that have been in accidents. And this sort of thing would be life changing for them. And I'd imagine for a lot of people it would be. So this is a really cool piece of research. Now, they've had to go through a long period of time of development and research to get to this point. What they're probably not interested in is the accounting behind it, because they're just doing their thing and that's what scientists do and engineers do. But from an accounting perspective, the accountants have gone and said, well, that R&D process can actually get broken down into two bits, the research bit and the development bit, and they actually have two different outcomes. So the research bit is really looking to find something new. It's going out and trying to find new knowledge. It's going out and trying to find different materials. It's trying to just find new stuff. Um, and there are a lot of misses in that. I think in a slide's time, I'll show an example of a situation where we've just seen that occur in the last day or two. Um, research, any money spent in the research phase does not get included. And the idea behind that is that link between you spending that money and you finding something is too far. Because it's not even do you find something, do you spend money, do you find something? you've also got to generate a benefit from it. And so to, to search for it, to research it, to find something, to develop it, do all those things, and then actually start making money on it is a huge divergence there. And so the standard set is said, well, look, you know, this is all good stuff, but you can't include it on the balance sheet. So any money in the research phase gets put through to the profit and loss statement straight up. Now, taking a step back a little bit, um, and outside of accounting for a second, just more philosophical, is you could say research fails in, so in the sense that you've gone along, you tried to find something and you've not found it. But on a deeper philosophical level, that has also helped you get to an outcome because then you know that path is not there, that path doesn't work. And then you can keep sort of searching and keep going on different elements. So on a deeper level, I don't know if any research is ever not gonna get an outcome. It might not get the outcome you want right now, but it will help you along that deep, that sort of longer path to get where you want to go. In saying that, yesterday, or two days ago, I should say, um, Surtech Medical, Surtex, Surtech Medical, so this is from 17, well, initially the 17th of March, lost a billion dollars in market value. They lost 55% of their share price in the day. Now, the following day, they bounced back 30%, so, you know, people, act a bit funny from time to time. But they were in a cancer trial and the results from that cancer trial weren't good. And so 
the market was building that price in. And this is picking up that cancer trials and drug trials are difficult, they're hard, they don't always win. Um, but we keep, I suppose, trying, and that's an important thing. In terms of the development phase, this is then you found something that works. Now, if you've been reading the papers, this is, Google have been working on this for a little while, and though it's been getting a lot more press lately, but Google have now a self-driving car. They can go around and sort of navigate and do its various things. Now, this is not new technology. They've got existing technology and they're putting to use and they're designing prototypes and they're seeing if they work. I don't know how well this is working, but I do know, and it's a small story from, and some of you may know it, a couple of years ago, Volvo, and you would have heard of Volvo, it's a fairly safe car brand. They, were, they designed, not self-driving to that extent, but could identify a problem in front of it and stop in time and actually properly stop. And so they brought it out, they brought all the media out to a test track to show this in action. And so they had this truck parked in the middle of the test track and they drove this car, well no one was in it, thankfully, so they drove this car up behind it to see this thing in action and press it there, tapes are rolling, all the rest of it. And it didn't work and it just rammed straight into the back of this truck, <laughs> which you know, is embarrassing, especially when you've got all the media there. But it's to say it's still not quite working right. Joe Hockey reckons we're going to be driven around in these things in the next 40 years, and he may very well be true. Um, may very well be correct with that. But they're still designing this stuff. So money spent in this phase may be recognised. But you've got to show a number of things. And it really breaks down to, can you actually build the thing? So. Technically, can you do it and do you have the resources to be able to do it? Do you actually want to complete it? Now, it may be urban myths, but you hear stories about you know, big oil companies and big car companies, they have already working kind of electric cars that run really well and all these sort of things and have been kind of keeping them off off the radar because they know when they go in it's going to destroy the current car market, it's going to destroy the use of oil and all the rest of it. Um, so maybe they have developed these things but they don't intend to complete it. Um, you've got to show that you actually can complete it and do want to complete it and that you actually have the ability to go off and use it or to sell it. Show how you're going to make money from it. And this is where the accountants come in. Can you actually measure the bits that go into the research phase and then go into the development phase? So you've got to be able to measure those different components. So that's research and development. Brand names. Now, a really interesting thing about brand names is they shall not be recognised. Can I borrow this table for a second? I'm just going to run. Oops. Sorry. That's all right. Cool. Oh. Companies spend a lot of money on brand names. So what we have here, I just went down to Market City. What we have here are two bottles of water. A Mount Franklin bottle of water, 600 mil. Mount Franklin owned by Coca-Cola, Coca licensed by Coca-Cola Amatil, and Mount Aqua. To me, they look pretty similar. Which one was more expensive? Mount Aqua or Mount Franklin? Franklin? This one was 69 cents. This one was like two bucks 50. <laughs> Looked to me like water. Now, it's been quite a long hot day. I actually need because we're going to try a little experiment now, because we do have a little bit of time today. I need four people. Someone who's thirsty. Four people, jump up, quick. Yep, just jump on down. Okay, we're going to try... All right, can you take one each? One more person? Excellent. You need two cups each, okay? And put on the outside of a cup somewhere an A and a B. A on one, B on the other. All right, because companies do spend a lot of money on brand names, they are important. 
I would argue that, you know, you're paying four times the price for what is essentially the same thing. Why are they doing that? Because it, why do people buy it when it's more expensive? This, I would argue, is pretty much the same thing. And we're going to find out if they can tell the difference. Um, but brand names are critical as well. Think about if any of you guys are smokers, you'll have noticed this with cigarette packaging. Cigarette packaging has gone plain paper packaging in Australia. We are world leading in that respect. Depends on which side of the fence you sit on. I think that's world leading. Other people think it's a bad thing. The tobacco industry is massively against it because they, they're really against it because they're cutting down what's happening in Australia because they know the UK is looking at what's happening in Australia. They know the US is looking at what's happening in Australia. And if it seems to work here, it's gonna roll out everywhere else. That destroys their brand value. Because if it was just the quality of the cigarettes or the quality of the product, brand shouldn't matter. It should just be what it is. So just the sake of argument, can I get all the A cups here and all the B cups just here? And then can I get you guys just over there looking away? We're going to see if this works. Cool. No peeking. OK, I want you guys to lay bets on whether or not you, these guys are no looking. No one needs to go to the bathroom. All right. All right, you can turn around now, grab an A, grab a B. Uh, one each. See if you can pick which is which. No, no pressure at all. <laughs> it's just drinking a cup of water. <laughs> it's B Mount Aqua. So it's B Mount Aqua? B Mount Aqua. B Mount Aqua? I can't tell the difference. Can't tell the difference? <laughs> Pressure's on. Connoisseur. These are the better ones. Can, so I can't tell the difference. Two gone B, Mount Acura, and B is Mount Franklin. Can you guys remember what I did? No. B is Mount Franklin. So it's hard to tell. Now, I mean, you do this with other products, and it's true. I mean, there's a lot of behavioral work done. Thank you, guys. Can you guys give them a quick round of applause for being guinea pigs? There's, there's a lot of behavioral work that looks at, and if you're in marketing, um, especially starting to look at the behavioral side of things, the people really can't tell the difference between that stuff and the value, the brand actually affects, and the price, and also price affects what you think the quality of the product is. So the intrinsic value of the product is actually quite difficult to tell. So potentially they're doing it for branding. Either way, brand is very important, but doesn't get recognized. Now, coming back to customer lists, so that's also included in here. Internally developed customer lists are not included as an asset, but are they actually an asset? We are living in the world of big data, data analytics, all these sort of things. I want to tell you a quick story. A couple of years ago, father in the US, I think Midwest somewhere, gets a letter from Walmart. Congratulating him, uh, congratulating him on his daughter's pregnancy. He was like, what the hell is going on here? She hadn't told him. Now it turns out that she wasn't, he initially went down to the store and went, what's this all about? This has got to be, because I mean, it was his teenage daughter. This has got to be, you know, I don't get this. She hasn't talked to me about this. This is obviously not correct. Turns out it was correct and she hadn't told him. They knew because of the way that she was using her loyalty card, the way that the purchases she was buying, they were, they were able to ascertain that she was, with quite a high likelihood of probability, pregnant. That is based on shopping habits and what you do. So a different example in relation to Target. One Target, I, one target employee I spoke to provided a hypothetical example. Take a fictional Target shopper name shopper named Jenny Ward, who is 23, lives in Atlanta, and in March bought cocoa butter lotion, a purse large enough to double as a diaper bag, nappy bag for those who speak English, um, zinc and magnesium supplements, and a bright blue rug. 
there's say an 87% chance that she's pregnant and that her delivery date is sometime in late August. They know these things about us. And if you use one of these, they know a whole lot about you. Because when you consider the reach that, shop, that stores like Woolies have, my local supermarket is a Woolies. My local bottle shop is a Woolies owned bottle shop, BWS. My local pub is a Woolies pub. It is owned by Woolies. My local service station is a Caltex owned by Woolies. If you use your loyalty cards, you can't use your loyalty card at the pub, but if, <laughs> probably a bad thing if you could. Um, if you use your loyalty card, they know how much petrol you'd buy, so they probably know how much you drive. They know what you drink, because if you buy at BWS, they'll know that. If they know your shopping habits, they know what you're buying. And they're using this, and they're collating this, and this is building a profile of you. Woolies have now just joined up with eBay. They're going to start linking that information together. Woolies have financial services. They have insurance. And they have been on record. There is, well, it was leaked, but there were, there was, an executive from Woolies talking about how they could start using your shopping habits to tailor your, their insurance premiums on your car. Because if you are buying a bottle of Jack every week <laughs> and are driving a lot and certain things, you have a certain risk profile. They're linking this stuff all together. Even in the last week or so, I read something about one of the bank executives talking about, um, I think it was at NAB, how they want to use what you're doing is sort of living data. They want to have good eyes on everything that happens and all those transactions that go through. This is incredibly valuable to them. Think about the ads that you get on Facebook. Think about the ads. Instagram have started putting ads through Instagram. Well, they've been doing ads for a little bit, now they're putting video ads in the last week. Those aren't just random, those are generated by what you look at. If you have Gmail, YouTube, or Google, the Google One account, they're picking up all that stuff. This is valuable. This is what they generate benefit from. But from an accounting point of view, that is internally generated. Oops, sorry. But Tesco is, an Tesco is similar to Woolies over in the UK. This is from four years ago. They're selling this stuff. They're selling this information onto other parties and making money off it. Now, this same information The same information in the company that has generated it is not an asset because it is the company building its business. But you take that same information, sell it onto someone else and they have purchased it, that is information they get to recognize or that is an asset they get to recognize. Um, and there's a slight other comment and I know you guys, I mean, I didn't have, well Facebook didn't exist until I was out of uni, thankfully. Um, but you guys are pretty much growing up with it, so you should be aware of the trail that you leave. But as you're starting to look at grad recruitment and, and going off and getting jobs, recruiters look at your LinkedIn profiles. They, you know, if you, Facebook is open, they'll look at this stuff. They do want to find out about you. So just be aware of that. This is valuable information, not just for brands, but also for recruiters and companies about you. So that's from the Daily Mail, that font of amazingly quality news. So out of all these intangible assets, goodwill can't, internally generated can't, research can't, brand names can't, development assets possibly, but you need to tick off a whole bunch of things to make that happen. Um, cost of internally, actually while I'm thinking about it, is anyone thirsty? There's not been, there you go. Which one do you want? <laughs> Obviously, you're welcome. All right, cost of internally generated. You can only recognize them, as we've just pretty much discussed, if you meet the recognition criteria. So it's only really development costs which get included. Elements of cost. We've talked about this, everything required to get it to where you need it to be. Subsequent measurement. There's actually not a huge amount of stuff we need to touch on in this. I'm just going to pick out the things which are different. Um, I pretty much changed depreciation to amortization, and that is the same as last week. You allocate the cost across the periods, um, sorry, basically you you're allocating it across the various periods that you have it. 
but the difference is, this is all the same, updated paragraph numbers. The thing which is something to consider though is this bit. Intangible assets, many of them do not have finite lives. And when we mean the opposite of finite, we don't mean infinite. We're not saying these things will last forever. What we're just saying is we don't know how long they're going to last for. So if you have something, it might be a patent which gives you five years or seven years, whatever it happens to be, that's finite and you can figure it out. But you may have something which is indefinite. You just don't know how long it's going to last. And purchase goodwill falls in that boat. Purchase goodwill doesn't get amortized. Purchase goodwill just gets impaired. So really, you're just looking at, does it have a finite life or not? If it has an indefinite life, you don't amortize it. Other than that, amortization works exactly the same as property, plant, and equipment. All that talk of water, I'm, I'm a bit thirsty. <coughs> Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the cost model today because I know it's something and if you guys have had your tutes and for those who've got the tutorial after this we will talk about it in more detail but it is something I do want to talk about the ceiling because it is something which is important to get your head around so amortization is just allocation but we have the cost and revaluation model also the same cost and revaluation model um, as for property plant and equipment I'll give you a heads up with this pretty much pretty much most intangible assets cannot be done under the revaluation model. So pretty much all of them will be done under the cost model. And the reason for that will be shown shortly. Right, so the cost model. This is good to just refresh because it relates to property, plant and equipment as well. The cost model, the starting point is cost. That's the highest it can ever be. You can buy a piece of land for a million, you can buy a taxi license for 300,000, that's it. If you record it at cost, that amount is the maximum. It could be worth 100 million, still 300,000. It can come under that, it can be impaired and it can get depreciated, but that's the limit. Fair value, on the other hand, the starting point is fair value. Bless you. So if you buy it for 300,000 and it happens to be worth 400,000, you take it up. If it happens to be worth less, you take it down. The starting point changes. And a comment about that, as you may have started to pick up, is around fair value. Every time you do fair value, if you have depreciation or amortization in there, you need to clean it out. So any depreciation which is sitting in an account or any accumulated depreciation, when you do a revaluation, you need to get rid of all of it. So it's like you're starting with a clean slate with that particular asset. Um, if you've done the two, you'll have seen that. If you've had a look at the extended questions, which I'll refer to at the end, you'll see that. Um, if you see the self-study questions, you'll see that. Um, you need to get rid of any accumulated depreciation when you do a revaluation. Um, there's a very good reason for it because it wouldn't make sense otherwise. Um, for anyone in the 7.30 shoot, we can talk about that when we get to it. Hmm. Good. Right. Fair value measurement. Talking about fair value, I wanted to touch on this because we will see a lot of fair values over what we're doing and I think it's useful to talk about fair value in a little bit more detail. Fair value is the price that would be received to sell an asset in an orderly transaction between market participants at the measurement date. So, you sir, what's your name? What's your name? Chasm. Chasm. All right. So, I'm selling this bottle of water to Chasm. It's, he could, let's just say it's a dollar. You could get a bottle of water from anywhere for a dollar. You're not, I'm not forced to sell this because you know, you're not really, really thirsty or to, you could argue at a music festival or wherever and you need a bottle of water and they're gonna charge you an exorbitant cost. It's an orderly market. Whatever the price is, it's an orderly transaction. We're market participants, that's fair value. Now that's not always gonna be possible to see this because we can see that visible. You can see a whole bunch of water resellers and they're all selling it for a dollar. It's a visible price. Um, so this idea with valuation techniques, and they stress this, valuation techniques used to measure fair value, so the dollar of water we're selling the chasm, or that you potentially could buy, we want to maximize observable at inputs. So if you can see that bottle of water or something similar to that out in the market, that's what you want to try to use. 
What you don't want to use or try to minimize is internal management estimates of fair value. You are allowed to use them, but you try to minimize those uses where possible. And think about that from a, from a verifiability point of view. Think about that from a bias point of view, why you think that would be. So we've got three different levels. So this is actually quite new in the last few years. I want you to put your thinking caps on for this. I want you to sort of think about what examples for a couple of these could be. So level one, a quoted prices in active markets for identical assets. So what could be something which falls under level one? Somebody phoned a friend and got an answer? Something identical. You guys are business students. Any finance students here? That's giving you a massive... Bank Shares. Shares are definitely... If, bank, if bills and bonds are identical, then you can include them. So a lot of securities will be identical. There'll be markets for them. If you want to look at what BHP or Woolworth shares are, they're quoted, it's an active market, you can see what the valuations are, and they're identical. So if I hold 10 BHP shares, I can just open up the papers if I'm a Luddite and actually see what it's traded at. That's where that is. How happy are you with the objectivity of that number? Pretty happy. Yeah, pretty happy. It's, it's almost as perfect a number in terms of objectivity as you can get. Inputs other than quoted prices that are observable, observable for the asset. So things which are quoted prices for similar assets. These are level two. So it's not identical now. What could be something which falls in this boat? Houses. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, houses, property. Property would be a really good example of things which fall into level two. Because even if you have exactly the same plot size, even if you have exactly the same house design, all the rest of it, the very fact is they're not on exactly the same plot of land. They could be right next to each other, but it'll be slightly different. And that will mean they're not exactly the same thing. But if one house sells, you've got a pretty good idea what the other house will be worth. So what you're doing is getting inputs from something which is really similar. So it's not a perfect fair value, but it's something pretty close. And the last one is unobservable <coughs> inputs for the asset. This is when you're generating management forecasts, internal forecasts around it. Now, for this, something like the Cross City Tunnel, which we looked at last week, would be an example of that because there's only one Cross City Tunnel. You can't pick it up and move it somewhere else. So in terms of a fair value, the fair value that they're going to get for it is based on how much they think that is, how much traffic they think is going to go through it and then just work it out as a cash flow proposition. Subjectivity in that is going to be high. And so that's why they talk about minimizing the use of those sort of inputs. So if we go back just to the definition of fair value for a second, fair value is defined as the price that would be received to sell an asset in an orderly transaction between market participants. But this idea of fair, it's, you know, I'm selling Chasm a bottle of water for a dollar. That seems like a fair price. Seems like no one's ripping anyone off. But as soon as you start going down to this one, most people don't have any problems with these two. It's pretty close to sort of objective as you can get. But internal forecasts, that doesn't seem to a lot of people like fair value. It seems like something else but it is still defined as a fair value. All right. One of those things. All right. To determine whether an item of property, plant, and equipment, and see, I got lazy. That should be intangible assets. Anyway, if intangible assets is impaired, an entity applies WSB 136. But I wasn't that lazy. I actually changed the paragraph number. That's OK. OK, another question for you guys. Actually, there'll be a couple of questions. At the end of each reporting period, an whether there is any indication that an asset may be impaired, um, an entity assesses that. And then if it is impaired, they need to estimate recoverable amount. Now, a quick question for you guys, because you know, we're getting on a little bit and just want to make sure there's a little bit of energy in the room. Energy in the room. How many of you guys have a f an active Facebook account? I'm not about to just go and friend you all, so don't feel scared that that's going to happen. Okay, so. A lot of people don't, or just it's that late in the day you can't get your arms up. <laughs> Let's try that again. 
How many people, how many of you guys, because this is, this leads to a second question, so I need hands up to start this off with. So how many, let's start this all from the top. How many of you guys have an active Facebook account? Thank you. So, come on, you can do better than that. All right. How, keep them up. I didn't say put them down. Thank you. Okay, of, of you guys, how many also have an active MySpace account? All right. Case in point, we already know now why an exam another example of how assets get impaired. Because MySpace in 2006 was purchased by Rupert Murdoch's News Corp for close to 600 million US, which at the time was about seven, eight hundred million dollars Australian. Fair bit of money. I started off on MySpace, couldn't figure it out. There's too much you could personalize it and add in code and was like, this is too tricky, I don't want this. Um, Facebook cropped up. And you know, this ends at 2011. You can imagine where this ends up going. Um, in 2011, MySpace was sold by News Corp. In 2009, the entire cost of MySpace was written off. So the 600 million odd that they spent, or the 580 million that they spent, completely gone. They just went, that was just a bad decision. Gone. They then sold it in 2011 for $35 million. Buy low, sell high. Anyway. And the people that bought it included Justin Timberlake. Now, they haven't seemed to have done much with it since then because I don't think many people still use it. Um, but there you go. That would be an example internally. I suppose internal reporting, they would probably have good sense of what their internal performance is like because those sites, you don't pay, just like Facebook, you don't pay to use the site. Marketing is what drives it. And if you've got no traffic, why would advertisers want to be on there? So if no one's going through it, just like a toll road, it's not going to generate much in terms of revenue. Massive decline, they do an impairment test, they look at it and they just write the whole thing off. The recoverable amount is the higher of fair value, less cost of sell and value and use. Fair value we've already talked about, value and use is future cash flows, which is actually really similar to level three of fair value. So it's a bit weird, but so be it. So if it's impaired, just like MySpace, you have an impairment loss. We've seen that. That gets taken out through profit and loss. We're not dealing with the second part of that because if we have impairments, if we have revaluations, we're not doing impairments. So it just gets impaired out through profit and loss. You can have a reversal, just like with property, plant, equipment. If things get better, if everyone starts jumping on MySpace again, it depends on what, which assets were actually impaired. But you can have a reversal, same deal as what we've seen. But this is what I want to talk about is in relation to this. If you have an impairment question in the exam, this is going to be critical because this will happen. If you have an impairment reversal, you can reverse it. But you are limited to what would have been the case had you not had a, had a reversal previously, had a impairment previously. So if you have, this is what we did last week, and I, I won't do it with all numbers, um, but if you have a non-depreciable like land, or even some sort, of pro, um, in, some sort of intangible which doesn't depreciate. Okay, so land with a cost of a million dollars doesn't depreciate. Assuming no, assuming no impairments or nothing else is happening, that land will get carried at a million dollars all the way through. And that's the baseline. So when they talk about having a reversal to what would have been the case, this is for a non-depreciable asset, this is what you're returning to. So if you go along for a couple of years and then in time two, for example, it comes down to this point. 
it'll track along. So it'll track along, and again, it won't be depreciated, so it'll just stay as a horizontal line. And if sometime later you have a reversal of an impairment, and you get a recoverable amount which is up here, you can come up, but you're blocked at where you would have otherwise been. So for a non-depreciable asset, it's quite straightforward. This is, when they talk about paragraph 117, that's the line they're talking about. They're talking about this $1 million cost. So that's fairly straightforward for um, non-depreciable stuff. But if it's depreciable, it works slightly differently. If you have property, plant, and equipment, or it could be an or some other sort of intangible asset, um, okay, property, plant, and equipment, same cost, but now we have to have a life, so it's got a life of ten years and a zero residual, so it's going down to zero at the end. Okay, so what will happen is, now it should actually be stepped, but you get the drift. So that cost or the carrying value will decline over time. Now this is the line that we're interested for a depreciable asset under 117. That ceiling, and we'll call it, that's what we generally call it, that ceiling declines over time because if you have this asset for two years, it would have had $200,000 of accumulated depreciation so the carrying value would be 800000 If you'd had it for four years, you'd have had $400,000 of accumulated depreciation, the carrying balance would be 600000 and so on and so on. So if you go along for two years and you have an impairment, there's also another effect that we need to take into account here. So at this point, we have an impairment, we go down to here. Now this is something that also commonly gets missed when you're doing this, is for, the, for T2 onwards, the depreciation changes. It is not the previous depreciation that we were calculating. And you can see that graphically because we're still going to the same endpoint, but we're starting lower down. So the gradient is actually going to be lower. Now, obviously, we're not going to use too much maths in terms of the actual calculations, but that will be a lower amount of depreciation per year, and how much it is depends on where we're at at this point. So let's imagine we're at T incredibly out of um, scale, nonetheless. So let's imagine that's the, si that's the $1 million, just to give you a marker point. So we're now down here. So we've gone down, we've depreciated, we're at this point. One of, the one of the things we're likely to do is to give you a recoverable amount below this point, but above this point. So we could do it about here. Because this looks like you could take it up to the 1 million, and you, well, because it's under 1 million. So it looks like you go all the way up to here, but you can't. For a depreciable asset, under 117, it's that point there that you can go back up to. So it's the point where you would have otherwise have been at. Now, you need to practice this with some numbers, because I mean, I think conceptually that you can kind of get what's happening there. Um, we have included extended examples. So these are much more complicated examples, which we actually used to do in the lectures, but have now don't have the time to. So if you go onto discussion board, so not the discussion board, if you go on subject documents, if you go just to normal list of subject documents and you go down to under in class questions, the next line is extended examples. And they will give you an example which uses this sort of setup. Yes? Paragraph 117. So if you've, got, um, if you've got that slide open, which I just was on, that's the increased carrying value of an asset attributable to reversal of an impairment, an impairment loss. So the reversal shall not exceed the carrying value that would have been determined had no impairment loss been recognised previously. So this is that line. This is what it would have otherwise been. And that's what you can come back up to. This is cost, yeah. Yep. 
All right. Um, okay, an impairment loss, goodwill doesn't get reversed. Because the idea behind goodwill is if you have a goodwill reversal, so if you have goodwill impairment, you bought this business because that's what goodwill is. You've paid over the odds, well not necessarily over the odds, you've paid more than the net assets for another business. That's why you have goodwill recognized. If you've had an impairment, that means you've written off that goodwill. If you have a reversal, it's not the return of that old goodwill, it's internally generated new goodwill. And so that's just like you building up the initial, like building up what's in the business anyway. Revaluation model. There's a couple of, we, there's a few things I haven't talked about yet outside of what's on the slides. The starting point is fair value. You do it with enough regularity to make sure the carrying value and fair value are the same. The difference is this bit. Revaluations can only occur if there is an active market. Now, very few intangible assets have an active market because to have an active market, you have to have a marketplace and they've got to be in a marketplace where stuff actually happens, so there's actually transactions and there is information ongoing to allow people to make pricing decisions and on that. If you have internally, if you have purchased goodwill, there is not a market for that. That is just one off. You purchase a company, it's generated goodwill. If you have a development asset, that's you spent money. There is no market for that sort of thing. If you have a patent, there's no market for that. So a lot of intangible assets don't have markets or don't have active markets, so you can't revalue them. But some do. And one of those, and a quick question for you guys, how many of you have used Uber? Okay, a few people. Uber X or just a normal hire car taxi? But the ones with, because there's the ones where you can just get normal taxis and hire cars which are off sort of not being used right at that point. There's also the ones where you can get just, just get cars. regular cars. Anyone actually, you probably can't say because they're getting in trouble right at Anyone a driver? No, you probably can't say. Um, how'd you find it? For it's easy. It's easy. Just yeah. like, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll... I'll <laughs> Did you get a bottle of water? Everyone I talked to in the, in the morning like you said they got bottles of water. Well, you we got, got a pizza. <laughs> and then we were like waiting for pizza to be made. And we just sat in the Uber car for like 20 minutes. And then we drove another 10 minutes and it cost us $15. So That's not bad. So it is. It's cheap. You didn't feel unsafe? No. No. Did the driver feel unsafe? Probably. <laughs> Probably. Um, but the reason I bring this up is I have the app. I've never actually used it yet. Um, but the reason I bring this up is actually in relation to the next bit. So this is the end of last year. The cost of buying a taxi license in Sydney drops to, the, drops to the lowest in six years. The cost of buying a taxi license now is about $375,000. It used to be upwards of $450,000. It's substantial. And the reason it has dropped is because of disruptive technology, disruptive competitors like Uber. Now, these are intangible assets. These are intangible assets which could be recorded at revalue at using the revaluation revaluation method. Cab charge is a listed company and has a lot of these. Um, so it is something. <laughs> that was well timed. Um, it is something where things which are happening here and now are affecting are, are doing the sort of things and affecting the sort of things we're looking at. So if I don't, know, I don't know where the cab charge is one of the companies that we had on the list. It might be worth looking at what cab charge are doing in the value of their intangible assets because if they're carrying them at, revalue, at a revaluation method, they're going to have to be dropping these down more than likely. Um, increments, if you have revaluations going up, this is the same as before. Now, I'll just bring these all through. If you have it going up, this would actually cross over. So you go up. And if it came down, you'd come across to this side. And if you went down first and then went up, you'd come from that corner down to here. The important thing is, revaluation surplus is OCI. It goes underneath profit and loss. Where the loss goes through profit and loss. The other thing to take note is, 
Whereas when you go up the first time, you all go through surplus. If you're going up reversing a loss, you actually reverse it out through a gain. So you're actually allowed to show a bit of gain if you're flipping around a loss. Same holds true going the other way. If you're going down normally, you cop it as a loss. But if you go down after going up through a surplus, you get rid of the surplus first, and then you go down through the loss. Um, you should have gone through that in a little bit more details in your chutes. For those that have me after this, we'll go through that um, and make sure everyone's on the same page. Tons of disclosures. Amortization, carrying amounts, information about material assets, whole ranges of things which are included in there. Um, have a look at what's going on in your particular company. I mean, that's the point of picking one of those. A couple of comments and then we'll finish things up. So assets are useful. Management have incentives to manipulate assets. Most things are recognized. Sorry, most things are not recognized. Lots of them aren't. The big issue we have is this one, when to recognize an asset. So that's intangible assets. Um, a few admin things just to finish up before I let you go. Firstly, thank you for the assignment one. That was pretty much everyone got it in um, on time. If you've had any issues around submissions, I've got about 10 minutes, so please come and have a chat to me. The mid-semester exam, we will be releasing past papers next week. Keep an eye out for that. Guys, couple, two more things and I'll let you go. I'm not going to fight it. The tutorial questions and summary solutions are being made available on UTS Online. So go and have a look on, on course documents, you'll see them there. Um, in addition, when we have lecture demonstration questions, extended versions of those are going to be available on UTS Online as well. We have extended questions on construction contracts and extended questions on revaluations and impairments available for you. Um, if you've got any questions, I'll be down here for the next 10 minutes or so. Otherwise, I'll see the 7.30 guys at 7.30. The rest of you, enjoy your weekend and I'll see you next week.